right, good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about this amazing process of reverse transcription and integration, the process of the DNA product going into chromosomal DNA. Uh, this starts back in 1908. Two investigators, uh, these two, Bang and Ellerman. Nobody smiled back then because they didn't know about viruses yet. <laughs> Bang and Ellerman discovered chicken leukemia virus, virus that causes leukemia in chicken. Now, back then, leukemia wasn't considered to be a tumor because it wasn't solid. Go figure. Eventually, we figured out it is a tumor. You know, all tumors don't have to be solid. They could be proliferation of single cells like leukemia. Anyway, it was caused by a virus. 1911, Peyton Rouse uh, discovered Rouse sarcoma virus. This is a virus that causes solid tumors, a sarcoma in chickens. He worked here at the Rockefeller Medical Institute. That's what it was called before Rockefeller University. And um, he got the Nobel Prize 55 years later, the, the longest incubation period for a Nobel Prize ever because people couldn't figure out this whole tumor thing. We're gonna talk about this in a separate lecture. It is an amazing story. So these were eventually called tumor viruses, the agents of these two cancers. And eventually they were found to have RNA genomes. Now we had later, much later, a young virologist called Howard Temin working at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I just happened to be last week, in fact. Unfortunately, he passed away, but uh, his legacy remains. He made amazing insights into RNA virus causing tumors. We, let's call it transformation of cells right now, changing their properties. He found, and many others did as well, that retroviruses cause permanent changes in cells. Instead of dying after a certain point, it transformed them so they lived forever. He figured out that this must be a heritable change in the genome. He said there must be something changed about the DNA of the cell's genome, and it was eventually figured out that retroviral DNA was integrated into the genome, became a permanent part of the host in order to cause this permanent transformation. This was a revolutionary idea, remember, because it's an RNA virus. It can't really become a permanent part of the host cell genome, yet that, was, that is what was happening because there were changes in the properties of the cells that can't be explained any other way. So the integration of the a retro, the viral DNA into the host cell is called the provirus. Remember, integrated viral DNA is the provirus. Now, in uh, 1976 or so, both Temin and Baltimore independently discovered reverse transcriptase in RNA tumor virus particles. So Temin had said th the virus has to be able to change the cell. Maybe it goes to a DNA intermediate, which then integrates. So both he and Baltimore said there has to be an enzyme in this virus particles that make RNA into DNA. So they published both independently in the same issue of Nature, I believe. Here's the article from Temin. And he has a lovely abstract here where he says that uh, these are basic observations essential to the DNA provirus hypothesis. Replication of RNA tumor viruses takes place through a DNA intermediate. And then independently, David Baltimore here uh, also discovered RNA dependent DNA polymerase in tumor virus particles. I actually did my postdoc with him. That's why I'm allowed to put a picture of him with a fish <laughs> on my slide. He, they both got Nobel Prizes uh, a few years later for this discovery. For the number 100 episode of my podcast, we interviewed David, and then uh, subsequently I interviewed him again. And my most memorable quote from the second interview, he said, I wish I had patented reverse transcriptase because it has revolutionized molecular biology. And I wish he had, I'm glad he hadn't, frankly, because then you get into patent battles and people can't use it properly. And I think it's great that a lot of incredible discoveries in biology were not patented, including RT and the polio vaccines, never patented. Okay, just my two cents. I have a few opinions. <laughs> so reverse transcriptase. This is the enzyme that countered the central dogma which Francis Crick set forth uh, after, shortly after figuring out the DNA structure, that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. You know, it's funny, if you, if you look at interviews with Crick, he later said, I never said that, but he did. He said, well, I didn't mean it. Okay, see, when people are proven wrong, they try to backtrack. But he said this, and reverse transcriptase reversed it. That's why it's called reverse transcriptase, and that's why they're called retroviruses, because they reverse the flow of genetic information. Very simple concept.
This revolutionized molecular biology. You could do so many things, like what? You could take RNA, make a DNA copy of it, clone it, and sequence it, and make proteins from it. The whole biotechnology revolution, a billion, billion, billion dollar industry based on reverse transcriptase. And it wouldn't have been possible without it, and many, many other things, basic research, forensics, all sorts of things based on reverse transcriptase. So here are the viruses that have reverse transcriptase as part of their replication cycles. It's not just the retroviruses, as a group six, they have plus RNA in their genomes. They carry in a reverse transcriptase, as we will see, to convert the RNA to DNA. There are also other viruses, the hepatitis B viruses. These are viruses with a gapped DNA genome, yet they have reverse transcriptase as part of their replication cycle. We didn't know this when Baltimore and Temin discovered RT and retroviruses. We didn't know what other viruses had it in their life cycles. And we'll see there are some others as well. I have a slide at the end which explains that. So today we're going to explore retroviruses and hepatitis B viruses. And you will finally learn how that genome is gapped and has an RNA and a protein attached to it. I know you have been waiting for this moment since the very first lecture. So our, our retroviruses first are enveloped virus particles. Uh, there's a schematic on the right. The envelope contains uh, glycoproteins, of course, to attach to host cells. The glycoproteins for many are called, uh, are made up of two components, the surface, or SU, and the transmembrane, or TM, that's the terminology that's used. Below the membrane is a layer of protein, it's shown in blue here, uh, called the matrix, or MA protein, gives the envelope a little stability, instead of having just an envelope by itself. And then below that, there is a capsid, uh, made up of a capsid protein, which for some retroviruses looks like cosahedral. Uh, and then within the capsid is the viral genome. The viral genome, actually two, two strands of plus RNA coated with a protein uh, called the nucleocapsid and C protein. So that whole capsid RNA assembly is a nucleocapsid. In addition, inside the capsid there are some very important enzymes. There's the reverse transcriptase, which has to be brought in with the particle because Hey, you know, it's interesting. Cells do have reverse transcriptase, but apparently not enough for viral purposes. So the virus brings in its own. Um, it has an integrase protein, a separate protein that is uh, what integrates the viral DNA into the host cell, and then a protease as well, which is involved in maturation of the capsid. And there's an electron micrograph of retroviruses on the left. You can see the membrane and the electron dense it means with the stain that's been used, the electrons can't go through them. That's how you image it, the nucleocapsid uh, in the middle there. All right, here is the genome of these viruses. At the top uh, is the genome of a simple retrovirus. I don't like to call them simple retroviruses. They are retroviruses with simple genomes. Some people call them simple. But as I said before, no virus is simple, even if it encodes one protein. Uh, here is the genome, and it's shown as a provirus. So you should know, whenever I say provirus, that means an integrated copy of the double-stranded DNA. And the proviral DNA has on either side two very interesting features, LTRs, long terminal repeats. We're going to talk about those. And then the genome, which for these viruses with simple genomes encode a, a gag protein, a pol protein, and an envelope protein. And these actually encode multiple proteins, as we will see. Uh, the gag well, this whole genome is, is produced from an mRNA that is transcribed from the LTR. It's shown here in the middle. It's capped, and you can see the gag, pol, and envelope coding regions. It's polyadenylated. This is translated in the cytoplasm to produce gag and gag pol. You get translation only to the end of pol. The gag gives you all these structural proteins, including capsid, nucleocapsid, protease, matrix, and so forth. We'll talk about those in a couple of lectures. Uh, and then the Paul precursor, the gag Paul precursor, uh, is made by a process we'll talk about uh, next time and gives rise to the integrase and the reverse transcriptase. This last protein coding region, the envelope, is not accessed by translation of this mRNA. Can't, the, the ribosomes can't reach it, so it is accessed by splicing. This long mRNA is spliced once to give a smaller mRNA, and that can be translated to produce. Uh, the envelope protein SU and TM. All right, so here's a great reason why you have to export unspliced mRNAs from the nucleus. This here on the middle 
has to go into new virus particles. It can't be spliced. So the, the, the principles we talked last time have to do with that. All right, an overview of the replication cycle of these viruses. The viruses bind cell receptors. The uh, membrane of the virus fuses at the plasma membrane. So you can guess that there's no P low pH involved for many of these because the plasma membrane is neutral. The nucleocapsid gets into the cytoplasm and breaks up so it's permeabilized. Uh, and then reverse transcription happens right in the cytoplasm. The RNA is converted to a double-stranded DNA copy still in some kind of a subviral complex, which means that not all the capsid has been pulled off of the genome. Then uh, the double-stranded DNA goes to the nucleus. It integrates into the host DNA. So viral DNA is blue. Host DNA is purple here. And from there, it's transcribed by host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase to give the mRNAs, which are then exported and make all the proteins needed for new virus particles. We'll explore assembly uh, in two lectures next week. All right, so that's the general scheme uh, of retrovirus replication. We're going to consider uh, all of these initial steps uh, very carefully today. First, reverse transcriptase. So it was newly discovered enzyme back uh, in the 1970s. Uh, like other nucleic acid polymerases, it copies a template uh, and synthesizes in a 5 to 3 prime direction. And a couple of un unusual features of this enzyme. The primer, it needs a primer primer dependent, can be DNA or RNA. So we have talked about enzymes that use DNA or RNA primers, but this one can use either one. The template can be RNA or DNA as well. So besides being a reverse transcriptase, which copies RNA into DNA, can also make a copy of DNA. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. And finally, only deoxy NTPs are incorporated. It makes DNA only. It doesn't make RNA. And the, the synthesis of uh, a product on the template is very much like we have talked about for uh, DNA and RNA enzymes before. Now, a few words on reverse transcriptase, very interesting enzyme. It turns out that bacteria and archaea have reverse transcriptase activity. So what does that immediately tell you? Eukaryotes didn't invent it. I don't think we invented anything, actually. We just stole it from bacteria and archaea. Here is the tree of life, in case you don't know what I'm talking about. We have bacteria today on the planet. We have eukaryotes, you and me, and archaea, which used to be, used to be thought they were bacteria, but they're not. They are an independent uh, line on the phylogenetic tree. There's a common ancestor to all of these down here. Bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes all have RT. The assumption is it must have been in a precursor, a common precursor to all three cells. So they evolved before the separation, archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. We think that RT was present a long time ago. Well, it had to be present when protein synthesis machinery arose. And remember, there was an RNA world first, and then an RNA protein synthesizing world. And so RT probably evolved during that period, and that is what allowed the evolution of DNA-based life, reverse transcriptase. Makes sense, right? You have an RNA world. Evol here evolves this enzyme, probably just by chance, gave rise to DNA, which had some interesting properties that RNA didn't have, like stability, uh, both physical and genetic, and others. And so it began to propagate throughout the, the various life forms. Now, reverse transcriptase, besides being in <clears throat> bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, and our genomes actually have RT in them, as we'll see uh, in a bit. Uh, it's also found in hepatitis B viruses, as I've told you, and a family of plant viruses called the Colimoviridae. And if you're thinking they can infect cauliflower, you're right. These are viruses of plants that infect cauliflower and other kinds of plants, and they have a reverse transcriptase in their replication cycle. We will talk about them a little bit at the very end. Now, back to our slide where we align all the proteins of the, different, the four different kinds of polymerase. Now we've talked about all of these uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. DNA-dependent RNA uh, polymerase is the one that makes mRNAs. These all can be aligned. They have conserved regions shown in red, green, yellow, purple, blue. And these are parts of the proteins that I've shown you on three-dimensional structures before. The important 
the, the, the colored areas all form part of the palm domain, which is the active site of the enzymes. And here C contains the two aspartates that catalyze the two methyl mechanism of nucleic acid catalysis. And I've shown you the signatures of um, uh, some of these active site residues before. And here today, RT has asp, asp, two asps. They coordinate the two magnesiums uh, that allow catalysis to occur. And again, these are all structurally related. So they must have arisen from a common ancestor. Another activity of reverse transcriptase. So the first activity is making DNA from RNA. There's a second activity in the same polypeptide. All right, now this gets a little confusing because we're gonna look at a third activity that's important, but that's a separate uh, polypeptide that's integrase. Reverse transcriptase also has RNASH activity. RNASH is an interesting enzyme that will cleave RNA only when it's in duplex form. And I say duplex, that means double-stranded. I say duplex because the RNA can be RNA-RNA, double-stranded RNA, or it can be RNA-DNA. It doesn't matter. The, the enzyme will still cleave it as long as it's double-stranded. The enzyme will not cleave single-stranded RNA. It's really a nice enzyme in that sense. And it makes what we call endonucleolytic cleavages. It cleaves inside, not at the ends. You know what the end, if you're cleaving the ends, do you know what that's called? Exo, exonuclease, right, you chop in from the ends. Endo goes inside, there are two distinct kinds of endonucleases. And so what happens, here's a schematic here of how it works. We have green RNA and we have blue DNA. And the red arrows show you sites of cleavage for RNase H on this RNA-DNA hybrid, it cleaves um, between the oxygen and the phosphorus, and it produces short oligos with five prime phosphates and three prime hydroxyls. Here's an example of that, P-O-N-O-H, all right? Cleaves five prime to the phosphate. Very specific, no sequence specificity, but it cleaves in this manner and gives you short oligonucleotides. We'll, we'll see the role of this enzyme in replication uh, in a moment. So here's this crystal structure of reverse transcriptase. Many different RTs have been studied, HIV and other retroviruses. Uh, this one uh, happens to be, uh, probably it's HIV, and this happens to be made of two subunits, P66 and P51. So here's P66 on the lower left, P51 here. They come together to form a heterodimer, and the catalytic site, the catalytic site is right in the middle here, and there's a duplex uh, uh, molecule. Yeah, there's a duplex, there's a magenta strand there going through as well. Now, this was made by a, stru a structural biologist who doesn't follow my color scheme for nucleic acid, unfortunately. But there's the template and product going through the active site. If you look at the cartoon on the lower left, it's probably a little clearer, uh, the fingers and the thumb domain. Uh, the, uh, Active site is in the middle here. You can see the two metals, Me2 plus, are located there. That's, uh, those are the metals that are catalyzing the addition of NTPs to the growing DNA strand. So the RNA is coming in at the left, DNA is made, then the duplex comes at the right. Now, the, also part of this enzyme, remember, is RNASH. That's the orange part here. Uh, in the structure at the top, the RNASH is in orange, and it's situated at the far end of the molecule, so that is the duplex. DNA-RNA hybrid is coming out of the active site. Then RNA-SH removes the RNA. It doesn't want it anymore. We just want a single strand of DNA. So the RNA-SH cleaves the RNA part of a duplex. This is what we have here, a duplex, the DNA-RNA hybrid. RNA-SH is cleaving it as it's moving out of the enzyme. And what comes out is a single-stranded DNA right there. All right, so that is the structure of the enzyme and how things work. Now this is a very slow enzyme. The, the genome of retroviruses is about 9 KB. It takes four hours <laughs> for this enzyme to make a copy of that. This is terribly slow. I don't know why it's so slow. It's also error prone. It makes a mistake every 10,000 to 1 million nucleotides. Well, you know, that's not very unusual for RNA-based enzymes. And this misincorporation we'll talk about later. This is the basis of evolution of all life. As I said before, if, we, if polymerases didn't make errors, we would not evolve. Viruses are really good at making errors, and RT is, is an expert at making errors. First question, reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. 
Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? It's unique to retroviruses. It's packaged in the retrovirus particle. It also has RNA-H activity. The name of the enzyme comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information. It might have bridged the ancient RNA world and the DNA worlds. The answer is A. A is not right. It's not unique to retroviruses. As I said, bacteria, archaea, and even our own genomes have reverse transcriptase. Some people, someone checked. What is not correct is that the name of the enzyme comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information. That's where the name comes from. Okay. Let's take a look at reverse transcription. This is an amazing process. I was in the Baltimore lab. I didn't work on reverse transcriptase, but I was in the lab when people were figuring out how it works. And the steps I'm going to show you now were all sorted out. I saw people running down the hall with gels, holding them up and saying, look, look. It's really cool. So here we have the virion at the top left. In it is a double, is two pieces of RNA. The, the genome is diploid in retroviruses. And here it is shown in, uh, in a blown up view, the two pieces of RNA. They, of course, are plus stranded. The five prime end, there's a cap. Three prime end, there's a poly A. The cap, of course, is needed for translation, as we'll see on Wednesday. This RNA in the virus particle is coated with NC, nucleocapsid protein, which is shown by the little white squigglies around the genome in the particle. And uh, there are also in the virus particle 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase. So, you know, in these pictures we show two, but that's not an accurate representation. There are more, 50 to 100 molecules. 50 to 100 molecules, two copies. So you can imagine there's a lot of reverse transcription going on on a single molecule. Now, the RNAs, they code for the proteins, which I showed you before, gag, pole, and envelope. They, um, they hybridize a little bit at, at one end, as shown here. And they also have a tRNA hybridized to them. tRNA, of course, comes from the cell. This is a cellular tRNA that's packaged in the retrovirus particle. And so what it does there will be apparent in a moment. But this is the structure uh, of the RNA as it's in the virion. Now, why do we have two RNAs? We believe that it gives the virus some resistance to mutation. So for example, UV light, ionizing radiation, any kinds of conditions in the environment that may lead to mutation of the genome uh, can be corrected if you have two copies. So for example, and these viruses are relatively resistant to UV and ionizing radiation, probably because they have two copies. Now, when you UV irradiate RNA, you make changes in the genome, you make mutations. And here's an example where we have the two pieces of RNA. Let's say we had a change in, in the A part of the genome. The, what happens in reverse transcription is that the reverse transcriptase hops back and forth between the two RNAs in a random fashion. So it's always copying a little bit of the top one. Here we see it's copied A and then it shifts down to B and copies the rest, but it could easily go back. It just goes back and forth randomly. And if you have a mutation in one of the two RNAs, chances are that you're going to get some DNAs made that are going to be correct because it will be excluded in one of the copying rounds. Okay, so that's called copy choice. The enzyme has a choice of which RNA to copy, and it's random. It just, again, it flips back and forth randomly. There are multiple enzymes going back and forth, making multiple transcripts. Chances are you're going to get rid of that mutation by copying uh, the nucleotide from the other intact strand. Let's take a closer look at the tRNA binding site. At the top is the entire genome. Now, at the, just below it, we're exploding just the first few hundred nucleotides of the mRNA to show you how the tRNA is hybridizing. It's actually base paired to the genome, to a sequence of the genome called the primer binding site, PBS. It's not a television station, it's the primer binding site. Um, and here at the bottom, it shows you how the tRNA actually uh, binds to the RNA. On the left is the RNA from that PBS. Uh, in one region, bases 56 to 130. It actually forms a base pairing structure, a stem loop structure. The tRNA is shown in the middle. When the tRNA base pairs, it actually disrupts the stem loop. And you can see there are two distinct areas of base pairing uh, of the tRNA in this structure. And here's the three prime end uh, at the very top, which is going to be important. Now, a, a few other things about this part of the genome. There's a cap at the five prime end, again, needed for translation. And remember, these RNAs are packaged in the virus particle. But they're not going to be translated. They're going to be copied into DNA. You have these labels here. There's a little R. 
there's a U5, little U5, PBS, uh, and then there's uh, the, the leader sequence. And there are inverted repeats, uh, long and short inverted repeats, IRL, IRS, and IRL. The, the purposes of these will become apparent as we go through reverse transcription. Basically, they're there to allow production of the LTRs. The RNA does not have an LTR as we have it here. Only the provirus has LTRs. Those are produced during reverse transcription. It's very important that you understand this. But the LTRs, long terminal repeat, are not present in the mRNA. They are generated during reverse transcription, as we'll see now as we go through it. Let's start with the virus binding to cells fusion of the viral and cell membranes at the plasma membrane. The nuclear capsid is put into the cytoplasm. It begins to break down so that cofactors like NTPs and magnesium can get in. And then reverse transcription occurs in the cytoplasm. Let's follow reverse transcription through step by step. So let's, we're going to do it in these kinds of structures here. At the bottom, we have the green RNA. Uh, the five prime end is shown. And we have the tRNA hybridized to the primer binding site. And then uh, we've looped around the three prime end for reasons that will be obvious in a moment. So what happens is when the nucleocapsid comes in the cell, the reverse transcriptase begins to make a DNA copy of the RNA using the tRNA as a primer. So this is a primer-dependent enzyme, and the primer in this case is tRNA. There's going to be a different kind of primer later on, but the first primer that's utilized in reverse transcription is this tRNA primer. And it makes a light blue DNA because it's a negative DNA scan, right? The, the genome is plus-stranded RNA. It makes a very short negative-stranded DNA. It gets to the end of the RNA, the 5 prime end, and it stops. There's nowhere to go. And you may think, this is dumb. It's not dumb. It's brilliant. And you'll see why it's brilliant. Because it's going to lead to the, dupe, to the production of LTRs. So what happens here is that we're making capital U5 and capital R. Big R and little r are basically complementary sequences. All right? So they can base pair. So here, as we're making this um, blue DNA, the template, the RNA, is being degraded by RNA-SH. That's what the little chunks taken out there mean. And eventually, what you have is just a piece of complementary DNA. It's short, and it's hanging off here, still attached to the tRNA primer. The big R is going to hybridize to the little r at the three prime end of the genome. So essentially, the RNA is going to become circularized. That's why I said we have the ends here for a reason. The big R in the new product is complementary to the little r in the viral RNA. This blue piece of DNA is called strong stop DNA. Why? Because when people were first doing reverse transcriptase, what they did is purified virus particles and cracked them open with some detergent, add some triphosphates. They would run gels on the product, and they saw this 120 nucleotide piece of DNA. They couldn't figure out what was going on. They called it strong stop DNA because there was a lot of it. And now the name has stuck. That's called strong stop DNA. What happens next? Well, as I said, the big R hybridizes with the little r on the opposite piece, uh, the, the three prime end of the RNA, and that allows the enzyme to continue copying the genome. This is called a template exchange. There's going to be two. This is the first template exchange. The polymerase goes to start copying from the three prime end. It goes all the way around, makes the light blue plus uh, minus strand DNA. You can see it's continuing here. Uh, as the DNA is being made, the RNA template is being cut up and thrown away. Remember, this the, uh, product comes out of the enzyme. The RNAs chews it up. So as, as it's being made, the, uh, the RNA is being thrown away. However, there is a part of the RNA template that's kept. It's called PPT, or polypurine tract. It's kept because it's going to be used as a primer for the next strand. It's RNA, right? PPT, it's green, it's RNA. So the, new, the, the minus strand DNA is being made. And at the same time, in the third segment here, you can see the PPT is now being extended to make the second strand, the plus strand. You can tell it's dark blue. These are happening at the same time, multiple enzymes. All right, so now we're, we've almost finished copying uh, the genome the first time. Let's continue. Now we're looking at plus strand DNA synthesis. The PPT serves as a primer for the plus strand. It goes to the tRNA, and it can't go further than the tRNA. And in fact, it, uh, it doesn't want to copy the entire tRNA because then you'd have tRNA sequences in the genome. It only wants to copy 
uh, up to uh, where the primer binding site is. And there's a signal for it to stop there. So the DNA goes up to this modified base. Uh, the tRNA is cut off, as is the primer. And now uh, this um, blue DNA has a copy of the primer binding site on it, and it can hybridize to the primer binding site on the other strand. So it has copied the primer binding site from the tRNA, which is going to be complementary to the PBS on the minus strand DNA. So it will now uh, switch to copying the rest of that DNA. So you can see, now the, a little confusing here, there's a gap here which shouldn't be there. Uh, every year that's confusing to people. These ends actually are butting each other, there's no gap. But it's, the artist decided to put in a gap and we didn't catch it before it went into the textbook. All right, little piece of plus strand DNA, tRNA is removed, PBS is hybridized, and then that's gonna serve as a primer to make the rest of the plus strand. Let's go on. Uh, this is the last step. So here that, that structure is repeated. We have a full length circular negative strand DNA. We're now starting to extend the plus strand uh, from the PBS. Uh, that goes around all the way until you get a complete duplex made. And the product is a, is a fully double stranded DNA, which is different from the mRNA at the ends. So let's look at how that is different. So here's the uh, RNA to the right in green. We have at the five prime end, little r, a little u5 and PBS. And then at the three prime end, there's a little r, a u3, which is different from u5, and a PPT, polypurine tract. The, the uh, double-stranded DNA has this repeated at both ends, U3R, U5, U3R, U5. So there was only a U5 at the five prime end, there was only a U3 at the three prime end. What has happened is this process of strand template jumping has duplicated the ends of the RNA, so that gives you the two LTRs. And if you go back and think about how this works, you know, the, the enzyme copies the U5 and then the R, and then it copies the U3. So it has U5, R, U3. And it does the same thing at the other end when the enzyme comes around. That's why you have U3, R, and U5 duplicated at either end. So that's why this reverse transcription is so Baroque, because it has to make two LTRs. And you'll find out why we need two LTRs in a moment. Take my word for it now that you need them in order to get viral replication. So you have a complete copy of the RNA, plus the LTRs are duplicated. And when that LTR containing DNA is transcribed, as we'll see, you, you lose the two LTRs again. So they have to be regenerated in the next round of reverse transcription. Now, I know it's hard to pick all this up listening to me. And last year, a lot of people were confused, so I made a little movie for them, and you can find it here. The link is at Courseworks also. It's an animation of this whole thing with nice music so that you can enjoy reverse transcription. And it shows you going through all these steps. You can watch, it's only like two minutes. You can watch it a thousand times until you get it right. You can put it on your phone over your eyes while you sleep and then it will be embedded in your consciousness. <laughs> Our next question, which of the following steps occur during reverse transcription of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus strand synthesis by tRNA, two template exchanges, degradation of viral RNA by RNAs H, Generation of two LTRs, all of the above. The answer is E, all of the above. Uh, some people said that C is the only one, which the following steps occur. And you know, I just told you, priming of DNA by tRNA, two template exchanges. Yeah, the, the RNA is degraded by RNA stage, but we also make two LTRs. So they're all right. They're all things that happen. All right, we made a double-stranded DNA copy of the viral RNA. It has two LTRs. The next thing that happens is it integrates into your host DNA or whatever host the retrovirus is infecting. When people get infected with HIV, this is what happens. It makes DNA and that integrates into your cellular DNA. T cells mainly, but other cells as well. So here is um, the unintegrated linear DNA at the top. This of course uh, goes, the, the synthesis of the double-stranded DNA occurs in the cytoplasm, then it goes into the nucleus where it will integrate into your DNA. Two LTRs, here on the left and here on the right. And here is a host target. Now the host is in purple, the target is shown here in orange. The unintegrated linear DNA integrates into the host target and the result is proviral DNA, shown as line three. We have host DNA on the left and the right. We have retroviral DNA in the middle. The two LTRs are shown in green 
and you can see also the host target, which is in orange, has duplicated. That's one of the cardinal features of retroviral integration, duplication of the target site sequence to either side. Why it happens, you'll see in a moment. The other thing that happens is the loss of two nucleotides, sometimes more, at the ends of the LTRs. Notice AATG, and now we just have TG. CATT, we just have CA on the right. The reason for that will also be clear in a moment. We have integrated proviral DNA in the left LTR. Actually, in both LTRs, there are promoters, because the two LTRs are the same. They both have a promoter and a transcription stop site, in fact. So promoter on the left LTR works. It gives you, using host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, it gives you an mRNA encoding the entire viral genome. It begins at the promoter on the left side. It's too close to the terminator to have any effect. It goes through the whole genome. It terminates at the right end, and you get polyadenylation. There is a promoter in the right end, in the right LTR. And if you're thinking, could that transcribe cell genes, you would be right. And we're going to see why that can be a problem. That's why some of these can cause cancer. They can activate genes that shouldn't be activated uh, during uh, cell cycles. All right, so proviral DNA gives rise to the viral RNA genome. Let's look at how integration works. There's a separate protein in the virus particle called integrase. It's brought in with the virus particle, and that will lead to integration. It has to be in the particle. If you think about it, that DNA is made, can't be transcribed until it gets into the genome, and you're not going to be making any viral proteins for a while. So to integrate, you need to have the integrase in the virus particle. Here's integrase. Uh, shown like a dog bone, IN4, there is, it's a tetramer. And the retroviral DNA, the double strand that's made, is bound by the integrase. Two bases are cut off from the three prime end of each uh, part of the DNA. You can see them here missing. Uh, the NN are both removed. That happens by the integrase. Uh, that gives you a new three prime hydroxyl, which then attacks the target DNA. The integrase also holds on to the target cellular DNA. It allows the two three prime ends to attack the target DNA, it breaks the bond in the DNA, and ligates the viral DNA uh, to the cellular target in purple. The uh, two ends are repaired. So at the top here, you see uh, the two uh, ends ligating to the uh, cellular DNA, uh, and then they're going to be repaired to fill in each end and ligate it. That is why you lose two bases on either end, because the integrase takes them off to make a new three prime end that's going to be used to attack the host DNA. Uh, and then when the, so when, when these are ligated together, you're going to have a little gap at either end. And so it's filled in, and those are the orange sequences here. And that filling in on each end is a different strand being filled in. That's why you have duplication of the target sequence, the two orange spots. So the loss of two nucleotides and the duplication are all explained by the mechanism of uh, integration by the integrase. And again, the result is a proviral DNA integrated uh, into our DNA. A little bit about the integration. Uh, the integration is, is more or less random. It can go into any chromosome and pretty much anywhere, with the exception that it seems to have a preference for integration into DNAs that are tightly wrapped around a nucleosome. So here's our host DNA is shown here it's, of course, in the form of chromatin, where the DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes made of histones. And the integration seems to prefer uh, the sites that are wrapped around the nucleosome, not the free sites in between. Okay, So that's one interesting fact. But again, it can be in any chromosome, pretty much anywhere, as long any gene, as long as it's uh, around uh, this nucleosome. Now, the integration seem, seems to require a number of host proteins. So we're showing here the... DNA, the double-stranded DNA made in the cytoplasm, it's getting into the nucleus and then integrating. And there are a number of other proteins here with names you don't need to know, like BAF and LAP2 alpha, HMG, MRN, et cetera. These are cell proteins that are believed to be essential for integration. The complex probably in interacts with them uh, either in the cytosol or in the nucleus. And on the right is a structure, a model of how the uh, viral DNA is being targeted to the, to the cellular DNA. So here in purple is uh, a piece of cellular DNA wrapped around a nucleosome. In the middle are the, the, the histone proteins shown as alpha carbon traces. And here on the upper right is the 
uh, this is for HIV, but it could be any retrovirus. It's the viral genome, double-stranded DNA, four molecules of integrase holding it right near the cell DNA where it's going to start uh, integrating it. And then you see there are a number of uh, cellular proteins here. These blue ones are all cellular proteins which are needed for integration. So they probably interact with integrase and help bring the complex to the cellular DNA because it's not going to just bump into it. So the, the take-home messages here are that integration is uh, like more, it happens everywhere, but especially in places uh, where the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome, can happen on a chromosome, uh, and it also requires cellular proteins in order to occur. Now, again, the fact that integration can happen anywhere should set off a danger alarm in your head because there are some genes that have to be regulated. Many genes in us have to be regulated, and this is going to change that regulation, remember, because the LTR is bringing in a promoter, a viral promoter, which is not going to be subject to the regulation uh, of the cell, and we'll see how that happens uh, another time. All right, so there, there you have, again, the whole process of integration of viral DNA into the host cell and the production of proviral DNA, and then the mRNA is made, which then continues viral replication. So we start with two RNAs in a virus particle. That gives you one DNA in the host cell. We have a promoter built in the LTR. So that production of the LTR during reverse transcription builds the promoter. Otherwise, there's no promoter in that sequence if there's no LTR. The proviral DNA grabs the host transcription machinery to synthesize viral mRNA. So the promoter in the left-hand LTR and, and surrounding sites for DNA-specific binding proteins, they recruit DNA polymerase to the promoter, and the promoter starts to churn out mRNAs, which encode the viral genome. This is an interesting process. And of course, that viral RNA is then translated or encapsulated. We'll see that in a moment. I think this is really interesting because in the end, there's no viral DNA replication, and there's no viral RNA replication. The cell is doing everything. When the virus integrates its genome into that cell, it, the viral replication may kill it eventually, so there's no DNA replication. The only thing that's happening to make more viral RNA genomes is transcription by the host cell. So this is very different from uh, what we've talked about so far, where there are enzymes to specifically replicate the viral genome, whether it be an RNA virus, a virus-encoded enzyme, or a DNA virus could be a DNA, a virus encoded DNA polymerase or a cell encoded DNA polymerase. For reverse, for retroviruses, all the nucleic acid synthesis is carried out by the host. And there's really no DNA replication and no RNA replication. Now, a lot of my colleagues don't like that. They say, oh, of course there's DNA and RNA replication. How do you make more viruses? There isn't. It's our, transcription is making RNAs that get packaged, but there's no viral RNA replication as we've seen for the RNA viruses. Okay, let's take an overall look at this process before we move on. Uh, the virus, again, getting into the cytosol where reverse transcription occurs in the core. The DNA gets into the nucleus. It integrates, becomes a provirus, which then is transcribed by DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You get the mRNAs made. The full-length mRNAs go out, give rise to precursors of the structural proteins, and eventually those full-length mRNAs are also going to be packaged into new virus particles. We're going to talk about this uh, in two lectures, how viruses are assembled. Uh, and again, some of the genomes are spliced to give rise to the uh, glycoproteins. That's the overall uh, life cycle. Now, back to the proviral DNA. Let's talk about some of the implications of having a double-stranded DNA copy of a viral genome in our DNA. There's no way for this to get out, right? There's no way for it to get out. Precisely. The only way out is by transcription by host Pol2 to make an mRNA, which could then be packaged into new virus particles. And this is a problem for HIV, where many cells in us get, uh, get copies of the HIV genome integrated into them, and those cells are long-lived. They're not killed. And we can't figure out how to get the genome out. That's why you have to treat people forever with antiretrovirals, because they always harbor proviral DNA in some long, long, long-lived cells, maybe cells that live your whole lifetime. People are trying to figure out how to stimulate those cells to produce a uh, virus so they would die, but we haven't figured that out yet. As a consequence of this, this fact that 
once the DNA is in there, the only way out is for the cell to die uh, or to, for the virus to make mRNA. Our genomes are littered with ancient and modern, what we call retro elements. When these proviruses happen in your germ cells, the cells you pass on to your kids, they're with you forever. And this has happened many, many times. Every life form on the planet has some kind of integrated retroviral DNA in its genome. So let's explore that a little bit. Retro elements, we call them. Simply stated, these are sequences that move around in our genome via reverse transcriptase. That's what retro element means. It doesn't mean it's a retrovirus. This is a broader definition of what a retro element is. Proviral DNA integrated into our germline, sperm or oocyte DNA, that is called an endogenous retrovirus, ERV. Okay? So this is a very specific kind of retro element, a proviral DNA integrated into our germline. We pass it on to our kids. It's called an endogenous retrovirus. These are typically replication defective. We have hundreds and hundreds of different proviruses in us, endogenous retroviruses. I think I said 8% of our genome, something like that, is endogenous retroviral DNA. But none of them make infectious virus. They're all broken. They're mutated, so they don't make uh, infectious virus particles. Other animals do make infectious virus particles, like some mice are making infectious retroviruses from copies in their genomes, but not humans. 42% of our genome comprises mobile genetic elements, which includes endogenous proviruses and other retro elements. 42% of our genome is, is a, related to retro elements. It's amazing. They're not all viral, okay, but they are related to viruses. I want to show you that here. So these are the different kinds of retro elements that are present in our genome, human. And we know this because the genome of many humans has been sequenced and we can analyze this. So first we have uh, endogenous retroviruses. We have 7.7% endogenous retroviruses in our genome. All that is is a provirus that has gone in at some point um, by infection and has remained in our genome. Now these are ancient. None of these have come in recently. As far as we know, HIV does not endogenize. That's the process by which a provirus goes in our germline. As far as we know, HIV doesn't endogenize us, which is good, because it doesn't infect germ cells. There are no receptors. But other retroviruses have infected us many, many years ago. I'll give you a timeline in a moment. So these endogenous retroviruses are in us. They have LTRs on either side, gag pollen envelope genes. They're defective. They don't make infectious virus. Then we have what are called retrotransposons. These look very similar to endogenous retroviruses, but they lack an envelope gene. What does that mean? It means they can't make virus particles. They have a, two LTRs. They have a gag and a pol. They have an RT. That means they can move around. And that's how these, these are in such high numbers. Retrotransposons, 0.6% uh, of our genome. So what happens here is that uh, we can make an mRNA encoding this. The mRNA can give rise to reverse transcriptase, make a DNA copy of that mRNA, and then it can go integrate somewhere else because it has all the signals to make LTRs. You can see the, the duplicated host sequences on either side indicative of a LTR-mediated integration. We think that retrotransposons are the precursors of retroviruses. They were here long before viruses were around. They were mobile elements that could move around various genomes. And at some point, they acquired an envelope which allowed them to then infect other cells. The envelope is the protein stuck in the membrane. Without that, you can't infect other cells. You can move around your own genome. So retrotransposons. Then we have lines in the genome. These, for the rest of these now, the line signs and pseudogenes, no LTRs. Lines comprise almost 20% of our genome. And what these are are um, integrated DNAs. You can see there's a duplication at either end. There's no LTR, though. And then you have some open reading frames. And one of these open reading frames encodes a reverse transcriptase. So this is an element that can move around the genome. Why? Because an mRNA is made. The mRNA encodes reverse transcriptase. So I said our cells contain reverse transcriptase that can copy the RNA into DNA and it can integrate somewhere else in our genome. That's why we have so many, because they continually come out and go somewhere else. 
and some human diseases are actually known that are caused by integration of these elements into the wrong place uh, in our genome. So we have a lot of lines. We also have signs, which are um, shorter uh, pieces that don't have a recognizable uh, reverse transcriptase in them, but probably move around by virtue of the RT encoded in the line element. These are short interspersed nuclear repeats and long interspersed nuclear repeats. You can see there are a lot of them here. And then finally, we have what are called processed pseudogenes. Uh, here, there's no duplication of the host DNA on either side. So these probably don't go in by an integrase-mediated mechanism. What these are are mRNAs for any random gene in us. They happen to be copied by RT made by lines. They get converted to DNA, then they integrate somewhere, and that's why they're all over the genome. All right? So another way of things moving around and causing disruption. So those are what retro elements are, endogenous retroviruses, and then precursors of endogenous retroviruses, and then uh, elements that are derived by reverse transcription. We have a lot of them in our genome, and they can do a lot of things. Now, let me tell you a few interesting stories about retro elements. As I said, we have lots of them in our genome. They're called human endogenous retroviruses, HERVs. We have many of them. And there's one particular lineage called HERV-K, which infected our ancestors around a million years ago. So, you know, Homo sapiens wasn't around a million years ago. Here's the timeline of human development. Uh, here's Homo sapiens here. You know, we, we co-existed uh, with Homo neanderthalensis for a while. They died out. But our direct antecedent was Homo rodensiensis and then Homo uh, mauritiancus, et cetera. Uh, a million years ago, our ancestors would be right around here. There's no Homo sapiens, there's no rodensiensis. So Herv K infected our ancestor about a million years ago, and then was passed on to all the subsequent uh, Homo species, which is, and then we, got, we still have it today. It just shows you how long these can stay in a genome. Now, as I said, these are all mutated, so they're not infectious. But what a group did here in New York City, uh, Paul B. Nash at Rockefeller uh, University, he took the sequence, he cloned it, and he fixed all the mutations. And then he put that DNA back into cells, and out came uh, Herv K. It's like the, the, what is it, the phoenix. The phoenix retrovirus, it was called, because he rescued it. And now it's infectious. And you can study a virus that uh, was around. So these viruses infected our precursors about a million years ago. They went into our genome and then died off because they sustained mutations. You know, we have a, a DNA in you, unless it has some function, it's going to sustain mutations that eventually will wipe out the virus replicating parts of it. So he's revived it and he can study it, which is really interesting. So this whole idea that you get infected with a retrovirus and it goes in your genome, in your germline, that's endogenization. We've never been able to see that because with HERV-K, as I've just told you, it happened a million years ago. And we don't know of any endogenizations happening now until a disease of koalas was discovered in the early 2000s. So koalas, as you know, come from Australia. Uh, if you see them anywhere else, they came from Australia. They're mostly in zoos throughout the world, but they all came from Australia. And, and in the early 2000s, it was realized that they were getting sick and dying of an immunosuppressive-like disease. And analysis of these animals showed that they were infected with a retrovirus that they probably got from uh, wild mice. So the, the virus went from wild mice into the koalas and it infecting them, and it's probably immunosuppressing them, and they get lots of infections, like chlamydial infections, and they get very sick. They get leukemias also. It turned out, when they were studied further, that this virus was in the process of endogenizing the koala germline, okay? Because you could look throughout Australia, so here's the southeastern part of Australia, is the north up there, and there are koala colonies throughout, and people took their, their uh, DNA, and could see that in some places, none of the koalas uh, were infected. In other places, that's shown by the pie chart, zero out of 11 here on Phillip Island, and a few on Kangaroo Island, 24 out of 162. But as you move up the coast, you can see almost all of the koalas become infected. It's in their germline. They're passing it on to their offspring. And so as time goes on, more and more koalas are infected. So we, this is amazing because we can see it happening in real time, which we've never happened, been able to see before. Uh, and eventually, we think all the koalas are going to be uh, endogenized, and we can study this process. Now, it turns out that in some museum collections, um, they have pelts that they have saved from koalas from the late 1800s. 
So they went back and this is why museum collections are so important. They made DNA from these pelts and did analysis and they found this koala retrovirus in some of them. So it's been around for quite a while. It may have gone in even longer than that. But it's slowly spreading throughout uh, the koalas. Now koalas in zoos in other countries, not all of them are infected. So if you want a, you know, a uh, retrovirus free uh, koala, you can still find them in zoos and presumably they could be used uh, if this turns out to be lethal. If it wipes out all the koalas in Australia, uh, they could be repopulated with retrovirus free animals. Anyway, that's a really interesting story um, of endogenization happening in real time. Because you know, every, here's the thing, some human, pre-human, a million years ago got infected with a HERV-K, one person. And from that one person it spread to all of the antecedents of Homo sapiens and eventually all of us. So we all have HERV-K in our genome. That takes many, many, many years to do that. And so we're seeing it happening in real time in koalas. We're going from one or a few koalas to many. We can see the population dynamics, you know, how it affects uh, reproductive uh, strategies and all of that. Really interesting story. Okay, now the other side is that some of these genes are useful. Let me tell you a couple of stories of that. Um, when, now it turns out that some of these genes from retroviruses are beneficial and we've kept them. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, retroviruses infect cells. The viruses, of course, have the envelope protein on their surface, and that binds to a receptor, and as I've told you, it lets the virus fuse with the plasma membrane of the cell. Now, when these genomes are endogenized, the envelope protein is also produced, and in theory, the envelope produced on a cell could lead to fusion with a neighboring cell in the absence of virus particles. It turns out that this is why we have placentas because of this retroviral protein. Today, the protein is called syncytion. Uh, this is the structure of the fetal maternal interface of a placenta. The outer layer of cells is called the syncytiotrophoblast, and it's made up of one giant cell made up from many cells that fused because of the envelope protein of a retrovirus is on their surface. So the endogenization happened years ago, the open reading frame of the envelope gene was kept because it allowed the production of a placenta. And today, humans and many other animals have syncytions that are derived from retroviruses. There's no doubt. You look at the protein compared to a retroviral protein, you can see that it's derived from the envelope protein. This uh, co-option of syncytion from uh, envelope to syncytion has happened many times in evolution. Uh, if you look at uh, evolution of human chimps, gorillas, etc., various primates over millions of years. You can see two, at least two uh, instances where the retroviral envelope has been changed to be useful. So the precursors of these individuals did not give live birth. You can't do that without a placenta. But on the introduction of this retrovirus, it eventually led to the evolution of animals that could give uh, rise to live births via a placenta. Great example of why uh, viral genes can be useful. And then one other example which I like uh, is blue eggs. So some chickens, uh, you know, you go to the store to buy eggs, you buy white eggs or brown eggs. You ever see any blue eggs? You can buy them in specialty places. And farmers have bred for these over the years. You know, what will happen is they'll be breeding chickens and they'll see a chicken give rise to some blue eggs. So they'll take that chicken and breed it and breed it until they get chickens that make only blue eggs, and they're prized, and uh, they sell them for higher prices. It turns out that the original blue egg arose because a retrovirus integrated next to the gene that makes the pigment. It just happened randomly years ago, and a farmer saw it and bred the chickens, and now if you have a chicken that breeds, uh, that gives blue eggs all the time, it's because that retroviral gene next to the blue pigment has been selected for. So it's another example of the beneficial value. Of course, the chicken doesn't care whether its eggs are blue or white or brown, and I don't think it has any benefit, but it's really a nice illustration of how viral gene integration can give rise to this. Now, what's happening is that second LTR is driving the synthesis of the blue pigment gene. It's just integrated next to it randomly, and this is what happens. Now, this is a nice story. If the retrovirus goes next to an oncogene, then you have a problem, you have tumors, and we're gonna talk about that uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, our, our last question is, which of the following statements about retro elements is not right, not correct? There are many copies in eukaryotic genomes. 
they are currently entering the koala germline. Those in the human genome produce infectious virus. They can be beneficial, none of the above, which is wrong. Okay, what, the answer is C. What's not right here is those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They're all mutated. If we modify them, we can get them to make infectious viruses. If you said they can be beneficial, of course, of course they can be beneficial. They, you know what I like to say? With that, if we didn't have retroviruses, we'd be laying eggs and they would be white. Hepatitis viruses, hepadnaviridae, the other family I want to talk about that has reverse transcriptase in its reproductive cycle. Uh, here's a virus particle by EM. It's composed of an outer envelope with glycoproteins in it and an inner capsid that contains that weird genome that we've been talking about a bit, double-stranded, but it has gaps. It has a protein attached to it, and it has an RNA attached. So let me explain to you uh, how that happens. These viruses attach to cell receptors. The capsid is released into the cytoplasm. It docks on the nucleus. The DNA goes in, this, in the nucleus. It's repaired by host enzymes. The protein and the RNA are taken off and the gaps are filled in. So you get a closed circular DNA. <clears throat> that is then transcribed. <clears throat> you get mRNAs made. You get long and short transcripts that give rise to a variety of proteins. The long mRNAs get exported. Uh, they get translated, you build a new capsid with the viral RNA in it. So there's a capsid in step 11 with the green RNA. It's a full-length mRNA. It's put in the capsid, and then it's put along with reverse transcriptase. The RT copies the RNA, makes a DNA copy, and then those capsids with DNA in them are exported from the cell. We'll talk about the export process uh, in two, two days. This is a little different because the reverse transcription is happening in the cell before the virus even gets out. RNA is packaged just like retroviruses, but here it's reverse transcribed before the particles get out of the cell. Here, how, here is how it works, and I show you this because it has similarities to retroviral reverse transcription, and also it explains why the genome looks so weird. So on the upper left is the RNA that first gets packaged into particles inside the cell. It has a terminal protein, which turns out to be the reverse transcriptase. Uh, and this protein begins to synthesize uh, a DNA copy in blue of sequences adjacent to it on this little stem loop. Uh, and those sequences then do a template exchange to a region that's complementary to it over there on the right, DR1. So it's very similar to the strong stop DNA of retroviruses and the first template exchange. Uh, the first a minus strand is then made, light blue, goes all the way around the genome till it makes a complete copy. The reverse transcriptase is RT here, and it's attached to a protein that in turn binds the viral genome, and that remains attached to the 5 prime N. Uh, the RNA, a little bit of the RNA primer remains uh, at the 3 prime end of the RNA, which originated here. You can see the cap from the very 5 prime end of the RNA is still present there. And the next step that happens, here we are at the very top with that same structure. Um, that RNA primer, it traverses this uh, stem loop. The stem loop unfolds, and the primer pops off and goes to the other strand. So you can see this big panel at right here. The, the stem loop here uh, unfolds, and the primer gets bumped off and hybridizes to the other strand. The polymerase then copies it all the way uh, to the end of the genome there, and then does a strand, a strand exchange and copies uh, the, the minus strand DNA. Now, all of this is happening in the virus particle in the cytoplasm. And here, step seven, that is as far as it goes. So you have a full length minus strand DNA, which we made uh, already, and then uh, the RT begins to make some plus strand, and then it stops. And so what happens is you're, re you're left with a circular minus strand, complete circular minus strand, and only a partial plus strand. So you can see the dark blue in figure seven on the left. That corresponds to the dark blue uh, in the circular molecule on the right. And also left on that dark blue strand is the RNA primer in green. And that is also on this uh, viral DNA on the right here. And finally, the protein is the reverse transcriptase. It's in the process of copying and making a plus strand, but it 
It never finished, so it didn't fall off. And that's why the reverse transcriptase is present as well. Now, why this stops, we don't know. But what we think is what's happening in the cytoplasm. The capsid gets sealed up, and no more triphosphates can get in. And that stops reverse transcription. This process really needs a continuous supply of NTPs, uh, DNTPs. And once the capsid is sealed in the cytoplasm, that can't happen, so reverse transcription stops. And that's why you get a partially double-stranded DNA with a piece of RNA and a piece of protein on it. The reverse transcription stops at step seven. Uh, but it's okay, it works. The double-stranded, the funny molecule, the gap DNA, will come out in a virus particle, infect a new cell, and then in that new cell it'll be repaired so that it can initiate a new replication cycle. So that's the role of RT in the replication cycle of hepatinoviruses, and that's why the genome looks like the way it does. Now let me finish by showing you a summary slide which compares all the different viruses we know of that have reverse transcriptase in their replication cycles. So first we have lower right retroviruses. We talked about how the genome, so on these slides, what is packaged in the genome is in yellow, yellow box. So retroviruses, we said the mRNA is packaged in the genome. When that virus infects a new cell, the RNA gets in the cytoplasm. It's reverse transcribed in the subviral particle and then integrates into the host cell. Okay, and new, new, new genomes, of course, new mRNAs are made by transcription of integrated proviral DNA. For the hepatinoviruses, what is packaged is DNA. And that's because initially the viral genome is packaged as an mRNA in cells, but it reverse transcribes before the particle gets out. And so what gets out of the cell, the virus particle has a DNA in, in it. And that DNA, of course, then goes into a new cell. It's repaired to make covalently closed circular DNA, which can then be transcribed to make new virus particles. There's some other viruses with RT in their replication cycles that are similar. Here, cauliflower mosaic virus. This is a virus that infects plants. It packages double-stranded DNA, which has some defects. It has some gaps in its genome. Very similar to the hepatinoviruses in the replication cycle. When this broken DNA gets into cells, it's repaired into a covalently closed circular form, which can then be transcribed to make viral RNA. The viral RNA is then packaged. It's reverse transcribed before the particles leave cells, and that's why you have DNA in the virus particles. And finally, another kind of virus called foamy retroviruses. Hepatinoviruses and cauliflower mosaic virus are separate families of viruses, but retroviruses include the retroviruses we've just talked about and foamy retroviruses. I mention these because the foamy retroviruses actually package DNA in their particles. They have the similar cycle as the retroviruses, but again, the RNA packaged into particles in the cell gets reverse transcribed before it leaves the cell. And therefore, what's in the particle is DNA. So you know, our whole idea of how retroviruses replicate is clouded by or informed by the way retroviruses work. But it's certainly possible that uh, the genome can be DNA RNA. Again, it depends on where reverse transcription occurs, whether it occurs in the cell or if it occurs in the next cell after the virus particle infects it. So think about that, it's really important. Now one last, one last point I wanna make here. Hepatinoviruses and cauliflower mosaic viruses do not integrate into the viral genome. They don't make proviral DNA. And so consequently, they don't need an integrase and indeed they don't encode and integrase uh, in their genome. And, and if you think about how their replication cycles go, both these viruses, as soon as the uh, genome comes in the nucleus, it's repaired to become covalently closed circular molecule. And that can be the substrate for uh, the Pol2 of the host cell. 